Hello and welcome to the Restorative Justice Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Covey, and for today's episode, I'm talking about restorative justice and how the amazing book called The Kite Runner by Khalid Huzini relates to it. So to start this episode off, I will give a bit of a background on what restorative justice is, since it's not the typical form of criminal justice that most people hear about when talking about the criminal justice system in Canada. Uh, I believe the textbook called Restoring Justice, an Introduction to the Restorative Justice, written by Daniel Van Ness and Karen Heatrick strong published in 2015, gave a clear baseline of what restorative justice is on page 23 of the textbook. And I quote, to the best of our knowledge, the first use of the term restorative justice in the context of the criminal justice system was by Albert Eglash in several 1958 articles in which he suggested that there are three types of criminal justice. The first one is retributive justice based on punishment. Second is distributive justice based on therapeutic treatment of offenders. Third is restorative justice based on restitution, both punishment and treatment models, he noted, focus on the actions of offenders, deny victims participation in the justice process and require on the actions of offenders, and also deny victim participation in the justice process and require merely passive participation by the offender. Then restorative justice, on the other hand, focuses on the harmful effects of offenders, actions, and actively involves victims and offenders in the process of res respiration and rehabilitation." End quote. Now, I think that with restorative justice, it's good to have a baseline idea of what it is. But I'd like to believe that with restorative justice, Howard Zur, a grandfather of restorative justice, according to Van Ness and Strong, perfectly described the true essence of what restorative justice is. And at its best, in his book, The Little Book of Restorative Justice, on page 17, Zur says, Restorative justice is a compass and not a map which personally I think really describes the modern perspective of restorative justice approach. Besides what the textbook and various figures say about restorative justice, I personally believe that restorative justice process is something where you want to have the community, the victim, and the offender form a reconciliation or a healing journey, journey even to repair any damages that were done by the crime. Which... I think is very important because in the typical fashion of the criminal justice system, you have a lot of the typical black and white, uh, the offender commits the crime, the victim gets kind of put in the backboard, and the only justice that is served is that the offender gets a sentence, uh, whatever that may be. But with restorative justice, there is a very hands-on approach because it, since it involves the community, it involves the victim and it involves the offender, everyone is able to get involved and they are able to feel like their voices is heard. And I think that's really important because when only one side is taken care of, it's not really a true form of healing because you have all the other harm that was done completely left unfixed. So with restorative justice, you're able to get this complete circle of healing done, which is, of course, easier said than done because you're dealing with multiple perspectives, but you're still able to start that process, well, idealistically. Now, since I've kind of given a bit of a taste of restorative justice is, I think it's about time I start talking about the real juice of today's episode, which is talking about the book. Uh, now, with The Kite Runner, there's actually a bit of a controversy surrounding it. Um, according to an online article by the National Coalition Against Censorship, it was said in the article, and to quote, without prior notice or even an explanation, an Arizona school district removed Khalid Huzini's contemporary classic The Kite Runner from the school English curriculum. Students at the Williams Field High School, Arizona, 
were confused and angry when they discovered teachers were told to not use Husini's novel or to assign it as a piece of independent reading. The book had been part of the English curriculum for five years. One of the students, editor of the school paper, Jackson Washburn, told the local ABC affiliate that the book was to be replaced by John Steinbeck's Mice of Men. Now, The Kite Runner, uh, to be short, tells the story of a young boy living in Afghanistan during the rise of the Taliban. And it's no stranger to the controversy. Uh, the American Library Association placed it number six on its 2012 list of most frequently challenged books. It's commonly flagged for its religious viewpoint, sexual references, and use of off offensive language. Mice and Men is also frequently challenged in schools. However, Steinbeck's book, uh, making a list in 2001-2003 for bad language, themes of racism and violence. Um, now, if that doesn't get you excited for hearing about this book, uh, The Kite Runner, uh, I don't know what will, because any school that is willing to remove a book for those type of things, such as a religious viewpoint, uh, should be honestly ashamed because they're taking away a tear-jerking story about betrayal and redemption that has a very realistic take on restorative justice and healing because it's based off of a true story. Um, and I think with that, I believe that's a good segue into getting into the book. So, so to begin, The Kite Runner is told in a first-person perspective about a Sunni Muslim boy named Amir. Now, Amir lives in a relatively rich family, um, pretty well-knit, well-respected in the community uh, in the 1970s in Afghanistan. So the beginning, the very beginning of this story has Amir having a flashback as an adult in the United States uh, going back to his troubled childhood. Now, uh, when he's in this flashback, which is just presumably the rest of the story for the most part, Amir talks about uh, spending his time with his Baba and how valuable it was. For instance, uh, he talks about this time him and his Baba went to a lake and really, Amir really savored this moment since he never really had a strong connection with his Baba, who just to clarify, is his father. Um, throughout the book, Amir shows the struggles of this very strangled relationship. Um, continuing on, other than this emotionally absent father figure, there's a huge conflict that occurs that kind of sets the tone for the entire book. Amir's friend, Hazan, who is also a maid with his uh, father for Amir's family, um, was unfortunately raped by Asif, who was a local bully and actually ended up later joining the Taliban. Um, uh, Hazan was raped after this victorious kite battle, and sadly, Amir went to go get this kite, and while that happened, Asif uh, unfortunately attacked Hazan. And Amir caught, heard about this, caught it, and uh, kept it a secret because he was too scared to tell his Baba. Um, Amir would continue to betray Hazan throughout his life while growing up in Afghanistan, unfortunately, as he was very jealous and almost in the end envious, of course, of how Baba viewed Hazan. Um, Hazan, sorry. And he would go to such lengths as to not even tell Hazan certain stories because Amir actually read to Hazan, uh, but he figured out that Hazan could actually easily pick up on the stories and he would actually like figure out certain aspects of the story that Amir didn't even catch on to. So Amir would select certain stories, like very basic stories to read to Hazan, so he actually didn't further his education, which is a very selfish thing to do, obviously. But unfortunately, it just got worse through as time progressed. Um, Amir unfortunately framed Hazan 
for stealing a watch and a birthday money um, on Amir's birthday, which, of course, Baba found out about, and Hazan and uh, Hazan's father was unfortunately fired and had to move, and that was kind of the last Amir really dealt with Hazan. Um, it, it really, really messed up Amir, I think, from that point on. From when, from when I read the book, that's kind of the thought that came through my head. Um, and so after all of that happened, which is essentially the first part of the book, um, Amir also had to figure out how to live with this secret of the rape and treating Hazan just horribly throughout his childhood. And over top of, again, over top of all that, Amir was living in Afghanistan in the 1970s, which was this huge, violent, chaotic time politically. And so when you're a young adolescent dealing with all of this secrets and emotional turmoil, you also have to deal with this soon-to-be huge war. Well, it's always been a war-torn country. So he's dealing with all of these aspects. Plus, over top of this, you can really get the sense and perspective of Amir because Amir has this very modern, I would say modern now, and unique perspective on the world compared to the traditional um, elite elders uh, in Afghanistan during the time because these elders had a very traditional and strict view on the world where Amir not. So there's also that type of conflict. Um, over time, of course, the political environment starts to get even more unstable for Amir and his dad, which resulted in them fleeing from Afghanistan and moving to the U.S. Now, Amir was, of course, very excited about this whole experience because he viewed it as a way to be able to just leave all these issues behind in Afghanistan and not have to worry about it ever again because he never really thought, oh, I'm going to have to go back to Afghanistan. But that was not the case because the past never seems to stay in the past for Amir. And since Amir is eventually forced to go back to Afghanistan and face the harsh wounds he left unresolved when he moved to America, this is that. And so I'd say this is kind of getting to that very climatic, like, this is the height of the story, is when Amir finally gets the form of payback that Hazan needed to give to Amir, I guess, for keeping all that secret in. Um, unfortunately, Hazan did die, leaving a son behind, Sorab. And so uh, Amir has to... Amir actually eventually adopts uh, Sorab, uh, which is Hazan's son. But um, he, what happens is Asaf, the, the, the rapist of Hazan, is this huge warlord now. And so to get Sorab away from Azif, uh, Amir has to f almost fight to the death. Um, and it's a very detailed fight. And Azaf was very brutal, obviously, because he was this Taliban fighter. And he used brass knuckles for each blow. And Amir was for it. He he actually ended up laughing, I believe, and smiling through this because he realized during this fight is that each blow he felt like he deserved. And during that whole experience of that fight, Amir realized that this has to happen. This is something clicked in his brain where he realized that this is the starting of my healing. So even though he got brutally beaten up and injured, he it allowed him to start that healing process, that restorative process. Um, and so eventually it, the story does kind of end well. Uh, Amir is able to bring Sora back and 
he brings him back to America with uh, Amir's wife. And at the very end of the story, which I, re- I really like this part, is Amir uh, running to a kite with a huge smile. And I think that perfectly symbolizes how Amir is starting to get on this path of restoring the damages that was done. It's a very symbolic thing of I'm 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 back in Afghanistan, but I'm able to look forward. I'm able to start looking forward and I that really settles with me. So that's a very that's a very basic overview of what the kite runner is. It's a very good book. I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it personally. I wasn't expecting it, but it, I highly, I'm, I'd honestly recommend it to anyone who's really into a realistic perspective on how a healing journey can begin for some people, which I think is rare because I think when people hear a healing journey or a restorative justice, essentially, they just expect this, you know, very peaceful start of kind of just sitting down and talking with each other which in some cases people are lucky but in a lot of cases it's a very rough start there has to be that initial kick that the offender or in this case amir has to has to have for them to have that shock of of realizing their wrongs right and so how the kite runner relates to restorative justice and how it represents restorative justice is that because the book is made out of real events it it really sticks to you and overall the story tells of horrible mistakes that show that despite someone's horrible actions there is a chance for change for reconciliation also a very real type of healing that again movies don't really able to grasp i don't think because you know they they want that picture perfect ending which isn't necessarily the case and so but and so this really captures what restorative justice is it's a very realistic thing that the healing that is done it doesn't just happen after a healing circle happens and everyone leaves it takes months and months of time for restorative justice to really work and so I think that's how the Kite Runner really represents his restorative justice is overall it just it's this story of redemption. Even though Hazan sadly wasn't able to see that ending, Amir was able to start that and possibly even have at some point in conversation with Hazan's son about this uh, once he's older and able to understand the concepts and hopefully have this huge healing journey i think even publishing the book and admitting to those faults was probably one of the biggest steps amir could have taken right well not amir but the author um and so yeah i i highly recommend it and thank you for listening